What's up, guys? Welcome into another episode of Gorilla Hockey with Jesse and JJ, featuring Evan Rowell today. This is our first three-man podcast. I'm excited Ooh. for this. Yeah. Triples are best. Triples are best. I think that's I have heard that. What does that even mean? I've never heard that. It's from. I think you should leave. Oh. <laughs> Got triples of the hockey writers. <laughs> <laughs> Evan loves his little six. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very funny show. I I've, I haven't seen it. I, no, the gosh. reason I haven't seen it is because I think I went to watch the first episode and it was filled with uh, like poop jokes and stuff, and I'm just like, that's not that's. that's actually, cool. I think it is actually, yeah. but there is a golfing scene in there. Maybe that'll get you in there. Yeah, Wyndham Clark in the building today, a ball arena today, and apparently I was Say standing again. right next to him today, and uh, I didn't even notice him today. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, I I noticed him, but I didn't know who it was. Like I was like, oh, I don't know who this person in a bunch of Avs regalia is. But um, if I would have known that you were such a fan, I would have pointed it. Oh, out. Maybe it was a good thing because I might have shrieked. Like, would, ah! would you have recognized <laughs> oh him God, on on site? Like how oh, you yeah. said, like, hey, look at that guy. You would have been like, oh, you that's mean that guy? Clark. That's Clark. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a golf fan. I watch the tournaments beyond the majors. Not overly attentive. Yeah, so did you just not look at him? Because he was, like, <laughs> right next to us. Hey, Evan, when I walk in that locker room, I'm focused. I got a job to do. I'm so in my head about messing up room. potential questions. Okay. Oh, he was outside the locker room. Yeah, he was standing next to us outside yeah. the locker room. While we all stand around bullshitting. Talking about each other's outfits, right? Yeah. Well, exactly. see, what's, what actually stood out to me about him was his outfit. Because he was standing outside of the locker room in a bunch of abs gear. And I was like, who's this guy about to go into the locker room in all this abs gear? I'm disappointed in myself, but good thing we have two people here to carry the podcast today, so I don't have to do too much talking. I could just be in my head about how I messed that one up. Of course, Evan's here to talk Kovalenko. Uh. Kovalenko frenzy, right? Uh. I, I told him, heavy is the Kovalenko crown. Yeah, he did actually text me that. <laughs> it was a good one. But uh. yeah, he's been doing his media tour covering under. Andre Kovalenko all day. Nikolai. Nikolai. I knew I messed that up right, right when I said that. <laughs> yeah. Nikolai Kovalenko, he's in in Colorado, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, that's as far as is I know. It, is it a relief for you that he's in the U.S. for at least, like, your sleep schedule? Um, well, actually, no, because their games were always at, like, 10 a.m., so I was like, oh, oh it kind of okay. worked out. That's not bad. Um, but it's more like it's something I started last year where I was – I talked to some people, and he's like, oh, he, he could come over in 2024. So to actually have it happen, I was like, I got one right. Yeah. Well, and, and I will give you a bunch of, like, a, a ton of credit, all jokes aside, because I remember going back at, at, at least a year, maybe if not a little bit more, you were the first one that was like, hey, this kid that was a third-round pick is, like, starting to take off. Like, mm-hmm. he's starting to play well. And so, like, you were very much ahead of not only could he come over, but, like, this might be a guy that they are – interested in bringing over because i feel like you see that a lot teams pick players over in europe and that's Mm -hmm. really the last you ever hear of them you you have you've been on this for like a while yeah so that part feels good now (laughs) he's just gotta get healthy i I guess guess what what made you gravitate towards him what made you say all right i think this is the guy i'm gonna start to build my brand around (laughs) (laughs) it's not my brand i do talk about other things just to set the record straight but no it's just i I've, I had watched him before, but I started watching and I was like, I just like how he plays. Like, he's a very intense mm-hmm. guy. He plays a very intense brand of hockey. And he's skilled, too. And and also, like, part of it was because everyone knew the cap crunch was coming with the Avs. Mm-hmm. Like, they got all these big contracts coming. They need a guy who's going to come over and maybe be able to play for nothing. Yeah. And he's going to make under a million next year. So, I just – it was interesting. And people always – you know, are interested in prospects, but you just never know when they're going to get here. And I was like, okay, well, this is a guy that when he gets here, it's going to be like he's going to play right away because he's 24. He's mm-hmm. not like a 19-year-old guy who see in three, four years <coughs> maybe. So it's a little bit different. Well, and, and you know, there is a lot of talk about needing when, – when you're in these types of windows in the cap era, you need, like you said, those value deals. And that's one of the things I feel like the Avs are criticized – about a lot right now they've traded a lot of draft picks they've traded a lot of prospects so there kind of has been this like okay well who is that gonna be like who are you gonna and they've got they've hit on some good college free agents mm-hmm. but to your point that is the other thing that makes Kovalenko just so interesting I do also I want to talk to you a little bit about appropriate expectation levels mm-hmm. um but to your point it's a 24 year old guy who can jump right into the lineup and isn't gonna need this huge dollar contract right away with where the abs are at 
as much as I do, you know, pound the drum of like <laughs> trade every draft pick that you have, having players like that in the system, it's not nothing. Yeah, and I mean the other angle is you you said thir- he was actually a six round pick. When was the last oh, time was the he Az really? hit on a six round pick? Like if he comes over and he is something, yeah. Like the Avs are, I think, kind of rightfully criticized for their drafting, yeah. um, and drafting is just like so. You just it's kind of luck a lot of the way, and it's kind of lucky that he's broken out because he's drafted six years ago. But if you hit on a six round pick that you weren't expecting to, then that's just finding gold. Eustace was the third round pick. Yeah, okay. that right. use it, same draft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, but yeah, to, to your po- so and and honestly though, this is one of the big reasons why. I am such an advocate for where the abs are right now. Move on from some of these picks six years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're like, all right, let's see if he (laughs) can make the jump, you know, but, and and that's not a Kovalenko thing. Like the fact that he's here at all is, is amazing. There's so many of those kids that don't ever even get to this point. And when you do, you're talking about such a long runway um, that, you know, the abs didn't draft Kovalenko to try to help them win in 2017. Yeah. You know, it's a, hey, if he turns into something, maybe. And now look at this. Six years later, he can hopefully jump into a well, competitive team. It's kind of like when I asked McFarland after that. He said it's it's a fine line. Like, we're going for it right now, but we also know, you know, with the guys like Cal Ritchie and mm-hmm. Gouye of the other first-round pick, like, we know we're going to need guys eventually to come in that are cheap and talented. Like, mm-hmm. that's just how the cap world works. But also, they have not been afraid to throw – first round picks in, tra- in oh, trades around. they've kept their first round pick this year no guarantee they're gonna make it in yeah. June. so yeah. um all right so let me ask you what because because it, it does feel a little bit like because of the player he was in the khl there has been some fan expectations that have grown to like all right here it's we go hype. there's right, a, a lot an, of hype an, and another, i think evan has a lot to do with that hype. <laughs> an, another top six player coming in but like Everything that you've highlighted about the way that he's played in the KHL has been completely accurate. Mm-hmm. I guess my question to you is, how do you see that translating to what is a much, much better league? So, yeah, maybe I am responsible for a lot of the hype, but I also <laughs> feel like I've, I haven't, I've tried to make it clear like this isn't Kirill Kaprizov, guys. Like, mm-hmm. this is not him. Like, the reason why he is so viewed as like, oh, he said it and forget is because Jared talked about it yesterday. Like he watched, he's like, yeah, he's really good over. Then the first thing you mentioned is he's gritty, he's mm-hmm. physical. Like, yeah, he can do a little bit of everything. It's not, he's not a guy in Russia who you look at that league, and I've watched a lot of it. It's like guys that flamed out in the NHL because yeah. they were just scorers. Like the reason why he is so like viewed a little bit differently, and I think why the Avs like him a lot is because he is very much not just a scorer. Like he can do a little bit of everything. Um. And if you look at the team that he's leaving, like he was the heartbeat of that team because not just offensively, but like if the game wasn't going right, he would throw his body around, kind of get the game going. Um, and they are heartbroken that he's leaving. Like that <laughs> team is heartbroken that the fans are like, "Oh God, we are in trouble. We just lost <laughs> our best player." Um, but that's kind of the expectation. Is like what I think he is. Um, the injury kind of hurts things a lot because yeah. if he was healthy right now, they could have more time to get him in there, see what he is. I wouldn't expect him in the lineup game one of the playoffs unless, I mean, knock on wood, there's 13 games left. Reality, somebody might get hurt, Mm -hmm. um, and then they might need him. But um, I do think he's a guy that can fill in in the bottom six right now if they need him. I mean, they were patient for him for six years. I doubt Mm -hmm. they're going to hurry up and rush him into the lineup now. And I think even when we've heard Jared Bednar, even McFarland, talk talk about him, they, they are hesitant to really jump fully on board, right? We've heard Jared Bednar being like, yeah, we'll throw him in the lineup, see what he's got. Not so much like, oh, yeah, we can't wait till he gets here. So I think there's even a, from the avalanche just a let's, let's make sure we have exactly what we need in this guy before we just go with him. And I think even the additions they made kind of gives them that opportunity mm-hmm. to be like, okay, let's see what he, what he can do. Because to bring in a Trent, and I know they lost O'Connor, but to bring in a Trent and a Duhame, it gives them that – you know, that safety blanket, I guess I would say, if he didn't work out or if he wasn't, like, adjusting right away that they have guys that are NHL players that are ready to go. Well, and to your point, that is, from from, from what I know of him, from what I've watched of of Kovalenko, what, what is crazy to me is, like you said, so much of the KHL is just, like, 
skills competition mm -hmm. players. Like the top players in those leagues are like that guy's still playing, but they're all very skilled. He doesn't see, he, he seems like a Jared Bednar guy. Exactly. And yeah. I feel like there's not a lot of Jared Bednar guys in the KHL. And when Jared said that, he's like, yeah, he's good. He's really good. I was like, I've said all along, like, I think when Jared sees how this guy, the intensity that he plays with, like yeah. how he forechecks, um, and he's very much, he's not the best skater in the world. Um, he's not a bad skater, but he's not a great skater, but he's very much a pressure guy. Like he's, his motor's going at all times. That's where I think Jared's going to be like, mm -hmm. I can, I can use this. Yeah. Like, um, there's going to be adjustments. Like the KHL is not the NHL. That's the reality. Yeah. But, um, he was coached by Igor Larionov. His dad played in the NHL. Like he has, you know, he has probably an understanding of what needs to be done to, to succeed in the NHL. Yeah. And the Avs obviously like him. Like McFarland basically said, yeah, we think he can help down the stretch. And I think one thing we're seeing with all the trade deadline acquisitions is the Avalanche are very good at working through the kinks of the structure, the details of the game. As long as you get out there and give effort, you're, you know, high speed, chasing that puck in the corners every chance you get, I think you're going to fit in just fine, and then he'll work out, you know, the details later. Well, I, and I remember Jared talking about that right around, right after the deadline. Someone asked, like, how do you get these guys incorporated in for a game like this? And he said, like, I don't remember what his exact quote was, but it was something to the effect of, like, Tonight, all I want to see is the effort. Like, I just want to see him working hard, getting after pucks. We gave him a couple pointers on roughly where to be, but I just want to see them work. And so to your point, like, they, they have a, a cadence for how they do mm -hmm. this, how they work in new guys, and it starts with what it sounds like a bunch of stuff that he's already very good at. Yeah, and I think um, I think he has skill, but he's not a skill-only player, so that's why I think they see him as, like, a bottom six guy, and then we'll go from there. Um, he's very, I think back to a guy like Martin Kaut and not to bag on a guy who's not here anymore, <laughs> but like Martin Kaut would play a game and you'd be like, did Martin Kaut play yeah. tonight? Yeah. Um, and I remember sitting next to a scout who's like, it's the same way in the AHL. Like he's just there. Um, Kovalenko is very much a guy where it's like, you, you're going to know if he played cause he's going to mm -hmm. find a way if it's, if the skill isn't there, he's going to find a way to impact the game in some other way get his body and go in and you know he plays a little bit of everything which again like <laughs> as you're saying all that i'm like yeah it's jared bednar that's jared bednar trade yeah, yeah jared See, what i keep like i keep thinking in my head is it sounds a lot like casey middlestat sure casey middlestat more of a top six guy kovalenko more of a bottom six guy but that's what i was most fascinated when middlestat came into the lineup is okay we knew about the offensive side of this guy's game but the way he back checks mm -hmm. uh i think that's something i i wasn't expecting you heard jared Benner today at morning skate mm -hmm. just talk about his defensive zone uh, abilities so it kind of sounds like a casey middleset 2.0 uh maybe with a little bit more physicality in there yeah maybe trenton might be a better mm -hmm. guy he's not as big as trenton but like he's very much a, you know he's going to do a little bit of the dirty work there um and you know we've you know, a lot of people are like, I don't see Bednar throwing him in the playoffs. And I'm like, I think Jared, like, if you play the way he wants them to play yeah. and you give the effort, I don't think he has any issue playing you. Like, yeah. he threw Sample Ranta into the playoffs mm -hmm. three years ago. Yeah. Alex Newhook, those guys straight out of college. Um, and this guy, he's coming from a different league, but he's older and he's got pro experience. So if he can play, I think he's going to get a shot and we just have to see him play. That's well, all. And then he he's coming out of a – and obviously there'll be some time off and injury, mm -hmm. but like he's coming out of a, you know, a playoff push in the KHL, then a playoff series in the KHL. Mm -hmm. Like he's already to dial that up a bit. I, I, I'm with you. I, I would even be surprised if we didn't see him in the playoffs. Yeah, I would too. I'd I be mean, very surprised. Like we said, uh, 2022, they used everyone. Mm -hmm. Like Burakovsky was a healthy scratch. Mm -hmm. Newhook was a healthy scratch. Abe Kubel was a healthy scratch. Like they're going to need guys in the playoffs. Like you just need bodies. He's going to get a shot. Yeah. I wanted to look at the injury a little bit because it was kind of – it was like a, the, the end of the game that they were getting it was eliminated. Like worst possible situation. <laughs> Last <laughs> shift in the KHL, he and, gets hurt. And yeah. just looked like a knee on knee, right? So uh, Yeah, he was lucky where his leg, I think, wasn't on the ice, so there wasn't like a little bit of pressure there, but it sounds like it's like a sprained knee, which – I my history with hockey has like always been like, oh, it could be like anywhere from like two to four weeks. I don't know. And mm -hmm. then you kind of play through it. So I don't think he's going to be out long term, and it doesn't sound like the Avs. Like Jared said, it's reasonable to expect him to play for mm -hmm. the Avs before the end of the regular season. But yeah, it was kind of like, oh boy, did last shift in the KHL that he just gets his leg blown up? <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Jeez. Yeah, everybody uh, 
clinched up a little bit during that <laughs> moment. But mm-hmm. uh, so they're setting him up to Loveland to, to play a little bit with the Eagles. Who knows if he actually plays game minutes? Yeah, uh, so he did yeah. go to Loveland, which I wasn't sure if that was going to happen or not. But he's up there now, and because the Eagles have a weird schedule, they don't play for another week. So who knows what's? I don't know. What, I don't know how their practice schedule works. I wonder if that's so. their way of like just quietly getting him on the ice a couple days, like. We don't have to worry about anybody getting pictures or videos of him out here. Could be. Well, and yeah. plus the Avalanche already have a lot of guys already skating mm-hmm. every every game. You know, mm-hmm. with a couple scratches every night, they they've got a full group mm-hmm. in front of them. So probably just don't want to keep crowding. And, the and ice with out their there. every other day schedule, like how much are they going to practice right. over the mm-hmm. next week? So right. yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he makes it on that next road trip. Of course, the Avs have five home games here and then and head out for a three game road trip. So it's kind of what I chance. think too. Plus, they, he said he wants to get him at practices, too. So, like, so that's a way to get him around the team. Yeah. Go from there. Interesting. Well, speaking of road trips, it feels like the Avalanche have kind of figured out their road demons, right? They were a very mediocre team, I guess, going throughout this regular season up until the trade deadline. Now this perfect road trip that they just came back from. What do you guys point to? Obviously, the deadline moves helped, I think, Less so from an X's and O's and more so from just a culture, energy, mm. identity vibe. Um, I think Valentin reinsertion is something to speak of. And then just the play of Miko Rantanen as well. But what do you guys like from that last road trip that uh, helped the Avalanche kind of figure out those problems? I just feel a completely different vibe around the team since the trade deadline. Like there is just a different air and energy in the locker room. Guys on the ice. Um, and I, I don't know. It, it felt like every road game earlier, up until this last trip, felt like every road game didn't matter how well things went at home. It just got tense and it got tight, and and everyone was afraid to make a mistake, and everyone was gripping the stick a little bit extra tight. And then it felt like every road loss became these like every road loss was brutal. Either you know they give games away late. It's tied, and then they lose late or in overtime, or they get blown out. And it just felt like every game they were going on the road expecting to lose. And for whatever reason, this last road trip, they just, like, the the, the energy was back in the room. And it felt like at morning skate, like, oh, they're going to win tonight. It's just a matter of by how much. And um, I I don't know. I I don't know if it's as easy to – I don't know if it's too easy to just chalk it up to there really were that many – problems in the locker room before and now that's all gone um but i don't know to, to me there's a completely different era around this group you know locker room aside like just looking at it on the ice like what was the difference in the edmonton game what was the difference in the uh st louis game mm-hmm. they have a second line now yeah and that changes everything the second line scored both their goals in regulation in edmonton the difference in that st louis game is that they got a goal from their second line that kind of separate things obviously they have a great top line but i've said all along on the road the Avs have been pretty easy to play against this year because teams are like okay well we know that line is good mm-hmm. the rest of the team's got to beat us and most nights like ryan johansson was going to beat him ross mm-hmm. colton nothing like ross colton is a good player he's not a second line center and teams can defend against that a little bit easier when ross colton's playing above maybe his weight of where he should be so now you have a second line that can kind of change things and take some of the pressure off the top line. And it really, it does just make, I think, a huge difference to this team on the ice and, and on the road in particular. It, that's honestly, it's, it's, it's an outstanding call out. And I was talking with uh, Arif, uh, Dean from High Sports, on the road. And, and that was one thing that, that he and I were talking about was matchups. And Jared Bednar likes to blend the lines and likes to keep you guessing. And, and I loved what Chris McFarland said on trade deadline day. We li- Jared likes to have a bottom six mm-hmm. more than a third and fourth line. I really would even say he likes to have 12 players more than he does four separate lines. And I, I just, Arif and I were saying, I said, this added depth and the addition of a, a second line, it just gives them so many matchup. Okay, hey, you're, you're matching well against McKinnon, Ranton, and Nachushkin. Well, what if I swap Ranton in with, Jonathan Druin and now I've got Druin and McKinnon play together which I feel good about and mm-hmm. still Val there but now I've got Miko next to Casey Middlestat okay what are you going to do with that all right hey that caused a little bit of problems you figured it out well now I'm going to swap these players and I'm actually going to move the- and it's just it gave them so much more flexibility I think that I think that's a great point they are much harder to match up against home or road 
very suddenly. And on that bottom six point, like if you look at the ice time in the Edmonton, those games, like the third and fourth lines played about the same. Like there wasn't really a difference. Like it really is, it's a bottom six now. It's not like we have a third line and then we have a couple guys we'll use here and there. We got a shelter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think maybe they were a little more targeted too at, on who they were approaching and who they wanted to acquire during the trade deadline, right? Not so much just, hey, we just need guys who are good, mm-hmm. but they maybe paid a little bit more attention to the mold, that what we were talking about earlier, the Jared Bednar guys, yeah, right? Yeah. They, they have an identity that they need to play to, and the players that they had at the beginning of the season, Ryan Johansson, Tomas Tatar specifically, did not fit that mold. Mm-hmm. Now you go out and get these guys. I just talked about how Casey Middlestat seems to be more of that mold than I even realized. You you bring up Trennan, Duhame, obviously a high energy guy, and uh, Walker obviously d- does a lot. So Nathan McKinnon's spoken very highly about Sean Walker. Has anyone else caught that? He, I wasn't on the road, so he, I don't. He, <laughs> he he Nathan McKinnon really likes Sean Walker. I can I, see why he's yeah. All over the ice at all times, it seems like. <laughs> well, and, and, and then the, the other point that I wanted to make, too, was the shortening of the bench. You know, with, with the minutes, the, the, the bottom six. Like, I think back to the, the Western Conference final, Colorado-Edmonton. And that, you know, that series goes 4 nothing, And a lot of those games kind of seemed to the abs really separated. And, like, I think back on that series, and to me, so much of that was halfway through the second period, Edmonton was having to essentially just – you know, roll two lines. Mm-hmm. They'd sprinkle in a couple guys every now and then if dry sidle had to go down the tunnel. But like, that was what I thought was the, the real difference in a series like that was Jerry Bednar was fine rolling four lines until, you know, eight, nine minutes left. And they were just able to outlast other teams. It feels like they have a little bit of that kind of mix again. And, and the opposite happened last year in the playoffs. Yes. Yep. Like the Evs had their top line. And then by the end of the, first round like Lars Eller they were putting him at second line center with mm-hmm. comfort like they had these weird combinations like they just didn't have enough depth to play and, and, and Seattle did yeah so it, it was very much like they looked at last year and I'm looking at last year's lineup and I'm like if Yakov Trenner was on that team would he have been on the second line like mm-hmm. I don't know like mm-hmm. that team just wasn't deep and now they've got they're 12 deep right now even I guess 13 we can say Kibiranta's still around too um, Kovalenko, whenever he comes, like they're deep now. Like this team, it does feel like that 22, 2022 team a little bit more. There has to be a little added, I don't want to call it pressure because that gives it a negative connotation, but maybe just expectations from the new guys coming in to bring the team to that next level, right? And I think from them, there's got to be a level of excitement. And I'm sure this is normal in any trade deadline because you have sellers selling to buyers. <laughs> So the guys who are on terrible teams suddenly get a little bit of reinvigoration in their season because now they're suddenly playing for something, right? Now they're suddenly on a playoff push fighting for the Central Division. So they kind of have this, again, pressure or expectation to make sure that this team is leveled up, to to bring it to that playoff caliber team when obviously they're all capable of it, that they're they're the Jared Bednar mold, but they just, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's all I'm saying. Oh, yeah. I mean, we talked to Jared a little bit about that today. And, and uh, you know, like for Casey Middlestat, this is the first time he's going to get to do any of this. Right. I don't know if Casey Middlestat's, like, ever played a meaningful NHL <laughs> game. Like, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, and you hear it any time the Avalanche get a new guy, how excited they are to be in that specific locker mm-hmm. room. Well, not only do you have to come in here and be in this locker room, you have to, you have to provide. See, you, but I, I do think that's, that's got to be – I think that's got to be invigorating for right. guys. Like, yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, th- I thought you were saying, like, is that maybe too much pressure? I do find it interesting, though, like now, you know, looking back on it, that Philly mm-hmm. sold and Nashville. That's what I was going to say is, like, sold. two of the guys they got probably would be playing in the playoffs anyway. Yeah. Um. So that helps. Middlestad is really the big one because he's played for a franchise that, like, for lack of a – like, that's a – a loser franchise yeah. like not trying to take anything away from them, but when was the last time they played meaningful games like they seemed like they were on the up and up last year now they they might make the playoffs this year because nobody in the east wants that last playoff <laughs> spot it seems like but it really has been like he was the one guy i was like okay he's a good player but how's he gonna adjust to playing you know this. a little bit more pressure behind nathan mckinnon where expectations are just a little bit higher and mm-hmm. he's hit the ground running really <laughs> Like, well, and, and I mean, like when we've talked to him about it, like I, I do think he is like genuinely excited about all of this. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I can't imagine that 
you're a competitor and and maybe I don't remember if it was us that was talking about it just you know off you know on off not on a show but like Casey started talking right away when he got to town about the practices and stuff like that and and to me it almost just sounds like like you said with all due respect mm-hmm. <laughs> that like that it's an organization that's just kind of like oh well if we win great if we lose we had some fun and we worked <laughs> hard and you know that was great and that I, I imagine that he's pretty stoked that like these are all these are all the you know, hyper competitive dudes to, to mm-hmm. get to this level. You have to be an ultra competitive guy. And I just I would I would imagine that we're going to I think we're going to see some great hockey out of Casey Middlestat because I think he we probably are, yeah. I think he's got to have the mentality of like, I'm not going to waste this. I just played seven years. I never got a taste of this. Who knows if or when I will ever get this again. And you hope you know, being in this, this organization that they'll have several more tries at this, but I don't know. It's he, I'm with you. I think he's the most interesting one to watch. I think there's another layer to it that goes beyond hockey. I think simply he just didn't like the city of Buffalo either. Right. I think it's a combination of not necessarily loving the organization and not necessarily loving the city you're living in. I just came back from St. Louis and I will tell you that place sucks at least where the uh at least where the, at least where the arena is uh you know and uh, covering peter the, skip this part uh, covering the nhl we kind of get limited to the area that the arena is right and in mm-hmm. st louis it's in a downtown and it's a very run down downtown right yeah, and it sounds I, like buffalo is kind of the, there's nothing to do around the arena not only is there nothing to do around the arena in buffalo there's no one there <laughs> I, I asked i asked <laughs> I asked Casey Middlestad about that because I said, dude, I we went earlier this year and I went out downtown. It was Friday and <laughs> I was the only one there. Like, I, I, this is no bullshit. I walked for just shy of 15 minutes from my hotel to a bar. I didn't pass another person on the street. That is 100% true. I'm not just trying to be funny. It's a Friday night. I walked 15 minutes in solitude through downtown Buffalo. And I asked him, I was like, was that just like a weird thing he goes no that's how every weekend is there and i was i just not only is there nothing to do there's no one to even do nothing with yeah that's that's pretty wild it sounds very boring it sounds a little bit better than getting chased by homeless people like we did in la (laughs) or like i just did in st louis uh but (laughs) um, you got chased yeah i mean one guy was very aggressive like (laughs) hey sir 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 trying to get me to give him some money after the game and i just Pretended like I didn't speak English. We, I don't know. we also didn't get chased in LA, but we were walking through downtown LA with our with the camera. This guy comes up, he's like, "Hey man, it's my birthday. <laughs> Can you take my picture or like a video?" And we were like, "No, no, we can't." And we do started that. walking faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we might be going back in a month, <laughs> so you never know. You can say hi to him. Yeah, yeah. Is it hey, still your birthday? That picture for you. Yeah. Um, guys, we keep hearing about Jared Bednar's love for the way the Avalanche Ooh, played wait, the Edmonton on, Oilers game. Out. I want you to go on record with what you thought about Emo's pizza because I made sure that you guys went and tried it. Uh, I think it was good. I'm very <laughs> indifferent. I don't think it was awesome or terrible. It was just like I, I okay, feel like most people fine. are not indifferent about Emo's. Most people are like, oh, it was terrible. Or I'm not a huge pizza oh. guy. I've I'm with you. I'm what? not a huge pizza I, guy I either. I just looked at you to get a, a <laughs> I know, confirmation I saw it of look of disgust. Well, all right. I, I think I pizza's, will s- yeah, pizza's a trash food. I, I will say, like, when I was in New York, I enjoyed because you had so many pizza options, and they all were like, here's $1 and mm-hmm. here's $5. And I had both, and I was like, I don't know what the difference is. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. they both taste fine to me. Whereas when I said that in the press box in New York, some of the local people were like, oh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> talk, talk about getting chased. Yeah, they were like. They were asking. like, oh, <laughs> there's a difference. I was like, I don't taste fun to me. The, the <laughs> Joe's Pizza, the Spider Man place, I went there and genuinely, that was, if not the best, that was one of the best slices of pizza I've ever in my life. I think it was three bucks, like three twenty five. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, maybe that's a New York thing, but like Chicago deep dish, like maybe this is sacrilege. I don't like it it's that not much. For me, dude. It's, I like Detroit style pizza, actually. Um, but I'm just not a pizza guy in general. Like, I'll have pizza, but it's not. It's more of a spicy I, ranch guy. Okay, all right, Ooh, Cosmos. Exactly. Run up there after this. Right where I, was going. I, I, I just feel like pizza's the ultimate, like, ah, I'll have a slice. It's just like. Uh, it is, but it's not like something I have to seek out, I guess. Yeah, all right, that's fair. You're right. It's like the leftover ingredients of somebody 
who was in the depression and only had so many ingredients <laughs> left, they made pizza. And boom, I'm not going to go that Pizza far. was invented. <laughs> All, when, when Gorilla has a pizza party, we're not invited, I guess. <laughs> well, also, JJ's the, 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 the most, I can't think, weakest <laughs> backbone. You should have heard this <laughs> rant he went on about breakfast burritos. Now, he's this breakfast burrito connoisseur. And he only eats the best breakfast burritos, and he wouldn't touch Santiago's with a 10-foot pole. They're disgusting. I'd rather eat dog shit than a, than a Santiago's He's burrito. getting some things crossed, but I, I'll <laughs> go with it. He did say that. I said I'd rather eat dog food over Taco dog, Bell. Dog. Oh, no, that is right. That is right. I'm sorry. Taco had, Bell? <laughs> point, point being, he took this super hard stance against Santiago's. 48 hours later, we show up to the studio. So I was like, hey, we got Santiago's burritos. He's like, I'll have one. I'm pretty Kicks hungry. Kicks the door in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is it? I was like, what? Yeah, no, he said he'd rather eat dog food than Taco Bell. And I said, no, you wouldn't. Dog goes, food. Very different from what you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I knew it was dog something. I couldn't remember if it was excrement or food. I'd rather eat dog. Uh, let's get back to talking yeah, hockey, sorry, please, and not pizza. Uh, again. <laughs> I was trying to get into how much we're hearing from Jared Bednar about how he liked the way the Avalanche played that Edmonton Oilers game. Yes. You were there, Jesse. What was so different about that game versus any of the other wins that we've seen on this recent road trip or even before the deadline when, you know, because this win streak goes all the way back to the 2nd of March when mm -hmm. the Avalanche lost to Nashville. So, to, to me, that was one where it was the first time that I felt like Truly, like like we say it sometimes, like ooh, that felt kind of like a playoff game. That was the first time where I felt like I watched this Avs group crank the knob to playoff intensity. Can I remind you of the Toronto Maple Leaf game? And would you still still yes? yes? Yeah, the, the, that game in Edmonton, I, I saw someone. I think it was Pierre LeBrun described it like this, and I completely agreed. That game was played at one and a half times speed versus everything else we've seen this year, and it felt like throughout the year. The games would get ramped up, and, the, and the, that Toronto game is a good example. The Avs would, would, you know, they'd do it, but it wasn't all the extra little details. They weren't finishing every check. You know, guys weren't back-checking on it. They're, they're, you know, it just it was, was regular season stuff. Um, that felt like as the intensity in the building ramped up, the Avs dialed it up. When the Avs dialed it up, the Oilers dialed it up, and it just both teams just kept climbing. Uh, and, you know, we talked about it in the media room yesterday. And then I, you know, I asked Jared about it, that that game-winning goal I thought was an example of that. You had two guys on the abs that played to the very, very, very last whistle, uh, and you had two guys in the Oilers that stood up, and it, it came down to the Oilers took two seconds off in that game, and the abs won. Yeah. That, and that was a difference to me. Was two that, seconds was the difference maker. I get you. Yeah. And it was that both teams were playing at that level where if you took two seconds off, it was going to cost you, and it did. That that game, I mean, I would say I wasn't in the building, but on TV it did look like it was a very different pace of every other game they played this year. And I think I said on this podcast, like before the trade deadline, I was like, I don't know if I think this team is built for a cup run just because mm. of how they're built. Um, and after the deadline, I was like, okay, I think they are. And then that game really convinced me, like they are built for the long haul here. Um, and it, I was watching, I was like, you know, Edmonton's more structured than I thought they yeah. were. <laughs> And then I looked at the, I was like, oh, the Avs had 43 shots on goal. <laughs> like, the Avs just, it looked, it was just, it was such a great game. Like, it really was a perfect hockey game to watch. And then the ending, I was like, I was probably like the Oilers. I was like, a shootout. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I looked away for a second. I was like, oh, uh, I go in? <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I won't fully put it on blast, but there was <laughs> a couple altitude people and then a, 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 someone who worked for the Avs who said, all right, shootout. And when the puck went off Nate's stick, and they walked away from the monitor. So, like, everyone, everyone on and off the ice, except for Nathan McKinnon, Arturi Lekkinen, was like, all right, here we go. Well, you know, shootout. We haven't done this in a while. And, it, like, yeah, I, I, I also agree with what you said. That was a game that showed you had to be built for the playoffs to play in that game. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a game on paper going into it. You're like, okay, we're going to see some offense. Mm -hmm. I, I might take the over tonight, right? Mm -hmm. This is We're going to see some goals. So, especially with what we've heard all year long, all couple years long about Edmonton's goaltending. I definitely thought uh, there was going to be a lot more goal scoring, but the ability of both the teams to play a defensively Sounds, focused yeah. game, uh, yeah, I think both 
the other thing, and, and we'll probably get into it later, is like that's a game where Georgiev, mm. he did his, he held his own. Mm-hmm. Like I, I feel like the Avs are now at a point where they're team built where it's like you don't have to win us the game, just don't lose us the game. Well, yeah. he, here's what I'm noticing with the goaltending, and okay, I'll, I'll I'll back us up. St. Louis, I was at morning skate. Jared Bednar is doing his his post morning skate hit right. Mm-hmm. Katie from Altitude is is asking a majority of the questions. And Jared Bednar starts talking about how the the Avalanche seemed to be playing way better the second half of the game than they are the first half, right? And that started leading my brain down a rabbit hole because that's exactly how I felt lately about Alexander Georgiev. He's starting the games a little bit more shaky. I, I wouldn't even call it shaky. Just He's given up more goals in the first half of games than he is in the second half of games, and suddenly he's really turning it on. Then hearing Jared Bednar s- start to say that, it seems like it's – more than just an Alexander Georgiev thing. It's a whole team thing. Then fast forward later that night, that's exactly what happened mm-hmm. with Eustace Annan in the net, right? They went into the third period tied 3-3, then shut it down, and uh, Eustace didn't give up a single goal in that third period. So I think there's something to the Avalanche are f- about halfway through the game, really, once they got a good understanding of their opponents, are figuring out a way to just completely lock it down and, and aren't giving up much at all. Well, and and – to both of those points, what I think you like right now, if you're the abs is they're giving you a chance to win every night. They're not perfect every night yet. There's even been a couple of those. um, Was it even the Edmonton game where there was a couple, one of the goals you just didn't like. Um, I'm trying to remember the goals in Edmonton. It was, it was one of the games on this trip. It was Edmonton or Vancouver. Where you were like, it was Vancouver. It was Vancouver. It was the Zadorov goal. Yes, yes. Because even Georgiev after the goal was like, oh, yeah. W- where it's just like, ah, oh, you don't love that. But then he locked it down. He said, okay, we're still within one, and I'm not gonna let this game get away from the team. And to your point, I think that's all you're asking for. Give us a chance to win, and we trust our team enough to, you know, give ourselves that chance. But yeah, you can't have your goalies giving the game away, mm-hmm. and that to me has been. That's been the difference in the last, let's say, coming out of the All-Star break versus I think there were a few games going into the All-Star break and then maybe on that, that you know, that trip right there after where it's like, no, you, your goalies cost you. Do you remember we did a podcast, you and I, Jesse, after it was about the first 10 games of the season, and I asked you who has been this team's MVP through the mm-hmm. first 10 games? Do you remember who it was? I think it was Georgiev. Right? It was Georgiev, yeah. right? So I think – there was a little bit of a lull in his game, but if he's getting back to the version of Georgiev that we saw at the beginning of the season just in time for the playoffs, I don't think there's anybody in here that can really have a, a shaky confidence in the goaltending right now. Yeah, sure, if Georgiev gets pushed out or injured, then we can all shit our pants a little bit. But <laughs> until, until then, I think we can be confident that Georgiev is the man they need, has exactly what it takes, because he proved early on to be – that kind of, he, kind of goal. He also seems like he's got a chip on his shoulder a bit. I think as fans will always, Patrick Waugh set the bar so high that <laughs> goaltending is always going to be the point where like, oh, is he good enough? Even Kemper, like he had a, like people forget, he was a Vesna finalist that year. Like, <laughs> he had a really good season. And yeah, he wasn't great in the playoffs, but he was good enough. Like mm-hmm. you just need him to be good enough. And the, I, I, a few, I think it was like right after they got back from that road trip and out east and I asked Bednar, I said, you know, Georgiev seemed like he's playing better. Do you think it's because he's getting more nights off? And he he looked. Do you remember he said, "What do you think?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "I went, yeah, I do think he is playing better." Because and he's like, "Okay." He said, Numbers and then look yester- pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And then yesterday he was like, "Yeah, I do think it is part of that." And I'm going to be like, "See, well, <laughs> I told you." Well, what my favorite part was about that answer yesterday was because Arif goes, "Is it too easy to say that he's playing better because he's getting nights off?" He goes, "I do think that is too easy, but it is true." <laughs> and I was like. All right, well. Well, let's also knock on wood and acknowledge how durable of a goalie Alexander Georgiev has been throughout his time here in Colorado, right? I don't I don't even remember one time where even there was murmurs of him being even slightly injured. That happens tonight, you know who to blame. Um yeah. I knocked on wood. You I'm did. safe. I'm yeah, safe. You did. Um that and then I I really do like I go back yeah, in New York, do you remember – did you overhear – it was uh, Larry Brooks asked him in New York. He said, you, you always thought you could be a number one. Uh, you know, does it feel like that's kind of what you're doing? And, and Georgie snapped me. He said, I didn't think I could be a number one. I knew I could be a number one, and I needed the opportunity. 
And that was one of the more like aggressive that I've heard Georgie be with someone. And I still, he really gets fired up to play New York. Uh, him and Igor Shosturkin were standing right next to each other on the ice at the all-star <laughs> game and had their backs turned to each other. There was no one else around. They weren't like in separate conversations. They, like, I think Alexander Yurgiev still has this. Nobody believed in me. They thought I was the guy. Then the second someone else showed up, they kicked me aside mm -hmm. and I'm out to prove that they made a huge mistake. And so back to your point of like, if he can find that form from the beginning of the year and keep that just little bit of an edge of I'm playing every night to prove myself. I, that's a, that's a scary combination going into a playoff run. Right. Like for opposing goalies or for opposing teams. Right. Assuming that durability holds up. Right. Because right. I think one thing we can all agree on is that if they have to go to any backup that they have in their possession, it's, it's going to be ugly. I, Georgiev is one of my favorite people to talk to in that locker room just because he's, He's very soft spoken, but he always has something to say. Like mm -hmm. he always says something very interesting, and he'll give you a pretty good answer. Um, well, and I think what he does over other players is he genuinely listens to your question and then gives you a genuine answer for it. Right? I think other players just kind of pick up keywords and just kind of throw an answer that they think you were asking, mm -hmm. and sometimes that leads to them a answering a completely different question <laughs> than you asked. Uh, but I think Alexander Georgiev, and you know, he'll even take a second to like process your question and make sure he's answering it genuinely and wholeheartedly so yeah i'm with you you got your phone in there pretty close sometimes yeah, to hear him, but <laughs> it is good yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> no um i think a five game homestand in front of them is going to be pivotal it's not exactly the most difficult of homestands but not exactly easy either let me name this for you guys and then tell me what you guys expect for the Homestand coming up, five games, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Montreal, New York Rangers, ending with the Nashville Predators. I guess just your thoughts over the next five games. Those last two seem like they're going to be pretty interesting. First three should take care of business. Like even today, I, I, I told you, I was like, this looks a little sleepy morning skate. Like first game after a long road trip could happen, but Couple also it's off. like it's Columbus. Like. We can't name five people on this team. Like, they should beat this team. Um, and then Pittsburgh is – I don't know what that team is. Like, dude. I think it was uh, kind of obvious the direction they were heading in when they signed <laughs> Lars Eller and Matt Nieto over the offseason. You're like, Retirement that's not going to make them better. They, they also made the big move to bring in Eric Carlson. I, yeah, nothing about what Kyle Dubas has done since he got there has made a lot of sense. And then Montreal they should beat. But New York – Montreal, they might beat in overtime. I don't know what it is about Montreal, but they get every game to overtime. <laughs> Amazingly yeah. so. And yeah. then New York, that should be a good game. That was a great game. Mm -hmm. I mean, first game out of the All-Star break, it was a little sloppy, but that was still a really good game when we were in New York. And then Nashville, we were just talking about it. Like, they're on this insane run right now. Like, do you, you got to take them a little bit more seriously now. So those last two games should be good. But they should, this is a good home team. It's a really good home team. They should be able to take care of business here. Yeah. Cop copy paste everything you just said. I think that's <laughs> yeah. And on. again, the the Avalanche. The last time they lost a game was against the Nashville Predators at so. home, or just lost a game in general. Just lost a game oh, in general. Okay. Uh, so with that, let's look at the Central Division. Obviously, a tight race. It's been a tight race for several weeks with the top three teams: Dallas, Winnipeg, and Colorado. How do you see it ending? And let's play a little bit of uh, let's look ahead at the playoffs and and what we envision happening and predictions almost. For the central, I I do I think the Avs end up on, on top. Um, I just think that they've got a track record now the last couple of years of when when they get into these kinds of tight races. Gosh, they 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 just have the a way of. Pull, I mean, this is I think four years in a row, they've been in this kind of jockeying race, and at the end they they find their way to the top. So I think they do that again. Um, I I I think it's going to go Colorado, Winnipeg, Dallas. Um, and I think that Dallas Winnipeg series is going to be a, a, a rock'em sock'em just slugfest. Um, I think it's all gonna be really fun to watch. Two weeks ago, I would have said Winnipeg, um, just because I didn't like how the Avs were built going down the stretch. Plus, Winnipeg had all those games in hand; those are gone now. Mm -hmm. The Avs are on a roll, so I think it is the Avs to to take. And um, they have two games left against both those teams, both at home, mm. so. They have the advantage there, and the only thing that stinks is if you get first, yeah. you might play Vegas. And yep. 
Like but, Vegas has been really very inconsistent since the start of the since their hot start. But like I don't think any team wants to play Vegas in the right, playoffs. Right. Like, well, and, and like really right now, and and I think it was yesterday. Jared talked about this. But like genuinely, right now, getting home ice is like that would be cool. But there's no good matchup. There's mm-hmm. no like, oh, you're really wanting to finish first in the West because that means you'll pull, you know, this team that probably shouldn't be in. You know, Minnesota. Like, you finish first in the West, you're you're probably gonna pull Vegas. If you win your division, but not first in the West, you pull Nashville, which on paper, I think the Avs are a much better team, but like Nashville's rolling. They got UC Soros in that. Like I just, I, I actually don't see any world where the Avs pull a first round matchup where it's like, yeah, they, they should breeze through this. Like, I think this is going to be a tough year in the playoffs for whoever. There's still a lot to unfold in the season. And so Based off what I'm looking at, it looks like there's five potential first round matchups for the Avalanche: Winnipeg and Dallas, yep, VGK and Nashville, and then throw in LA, LA. because Vegas and LA are kind of battling yeah. for that last spot. I guess of those five teams, what are your thoughts? Do you think do any put fear in your heart? Are you inclined to want to play one more than the other, or like you're saying, Jesse, it doesn't matter who you get, it's going to be tough. I mean, I think. <sighs> Again, if you're just talking on paper, I think Nashville's the worst of those teams. But they're not playing that way right now. Yeah, they're cranking it up at the right time. Yeah, and and, and like Ryan O'Reilly, guy who's been there before, uh, and you got UC Soros in net. Like that, that's going to be a great equalizer. Honestly, if I'm talking about how they're playing right now, I it's probably Vegas or LA. That, that you say you feel the best about, but I don't know. Yeah, my – L.A. would be the team I would be like, Cam Talbot. Like, yeah. that's the guy we're going to play. Mm-hmm. Like, and the Avs have played L.A. well this year, uh-huh. um, which in past years they – I don't think they have played L.A. well. Uh-huh. Um, right. So I think L.A. is a team I I would feel comfortable with them playing them in the first round. Um, I actually feel comfortable – I know Dallas is uh, – people are – I think the Avs match up pretty well against Dallas right now. Mm-hmm. So them – Vegas is just a sleeping giant. Like, are they like the Avs last year, where it's like they they just don't have anything left in the tank right. by the time playoffs roll on? But then you also then you're like, well, they're gonna get Thomas Hurdle back. They're gonna get him at some point, and he's yep. a good player. They're- Mark Stone, some point maybe. Yeah. Like, they could just add players that are really good, and you just don't know what that mix is. So yeah, there's no easy matchup i guess i would agree with nashville because i look at their team and i'm like how are they doing this yeah yeah like yeah, how yeah. are they doing this like roman yossi's awesome uc saros is awesome their top line is great but then you look at their the rest of their forward group and you're like i don't quite understand how this yeah. is working but especially in the middle of like a half-ass rebuild that they're kind of going mm-hmm. through Brand they traded coach. one of the guys to the apps <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. right. Um, like, like you, you almost just wonder if it's like okay if if you pull Nashville, can you hopefully get them on like, ah, you used up all your magic before the playoffs started? Cause, cause I'm with you. I just, I look at that team and I'm like, what? Yeah. what? The, I, I think I've said the Winnipeg is the one team that I just don't like the matchup because they're the opposite of the Avs. Mm-hmm. They want to slow things down. And if the Avs can't play with the pace that they want to, like, can they still play that way? Like plus Hellebuck. Hellebuck. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, Winnipeg's a weird team because, like, what's so funny about this conversation and, like, you know, they're very structured. That's a strong team. I don't know. You made it. The beginning of the year, everyone was like, I can't believe they didn't tear it down and mm-hmm. rebuild. I can't believe they convinced Hellebuck to stay. And now, so, like, th- that's another reason why I think that's a weird team. Yeah. Two years ago, they were a cup favorite. Last year, they missed the playoffs by a mile. They were terrible. Everyone thought they were going to send Shifley out and send Hellebuck out. And now suddenly they're back pushing for the top spot in the West. They're just a weird team. Yeah, and most of it really does come down to style of play. Like Rick Bonus. Yeah, he's beaten the Avs in the playoffs before because he just slows it down. So I don't know. That's just the weird matchup that I have in my head. Where I'm like, I don't know about that one. Like I can't say for sure because just the way they play just is the opposite of how the Avs like to play. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really care who they play in the first <laughs> round. You kind of got to get you got to get through everybody to get to the what final. What city anyway. do you want to go to? That's I'd love question. to go to Dallas. Interesting. Per, just for personal reasons, I got friends there. I've oh, been okay. to Dallas a lot. I really like it. Um 
opposite of St. Louis. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I also want to see the L.A. Kings play the Edmonton Oilers again. So uh, yeah, give them a third kick at it. Yeah. So just for that, I, don't, I hope L.A. and Edmonton are, are that first round matchup. That's how I'd look at that. They're gonna lose again. <laughs> Probably. I, I just I would love to see them beat Edmonton because like they should have beaten them each of the last two years, and it'd be nice to see them get rewarded. With I know. It, I think this is their worst team. To be I honest. know. That's the. Thing. It's like I don't know what to make of this team. City. I. I my whole thing about Winnipeg is like I don't. It doesn't sound as bad as people make it out to be. It just seems like getting there is the problem. G- getting there is the problem. If it was, if the weather was warm, again, especially to what you were saying earlier, like we don't really venture that far outside of stuff. Yeah. What would suck is being there for the two games of the day off. So you're there for like five days. I do think I would run out of stuff to do on like the main strip of downtown Winnipeg. <laughs> that was the thing, like Seattle last year. Like yeah, they have lost. I had a great time in Seattle. <laughs> that was a great time. <laughs> could go anywhere. You'd go down to the pier. It was great. Yeah. And, and truthfully, every city that you listed off, I'm double thumbs up with the exception of Winnipeg. And even then, eh. But Nashville, Vegas, L.A., or Dallas, sign me up for any of those. Yeah, five, four, five days in Vegas might be a bit too much. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last thing I wanted to get to you guys. I, this has been a fun podcast. I enjoy having you both here, but we got to get to some sad news to, to wrap it up. And that's Chris Simon passing away recently. I know for me, he was the first version of an enforcer I ever really knew. Um, for that reason, I always, you know, held him in really high regard. And I'll always remember Chris Simon for being that original tough guy here in Colorado. But I guess just the way that the uh, passing has happened is, is kind of the tragedy that is to speak of and uh yeah all around the cte conversation again that the nhl refuses to acknowledge yeah yeah like you said it's uh chris simon was a tough guy in like an era of of tough guys and so like that you know tells you a bit about like the, the player that he was um i don't know I, I do find it not to go too too far down this this you know rabbit hole at the end of the show but um I do find it interesting that the NHL stance is like, oh, the science doesn't quite link those things. And it's like, sure it does. Yeah. Like, sure it does. And even if it doesn't exactly on paper, it's pretty easy to make those connections. Um, you know, the, the, the players that are either dealing with it, have dealt with it, have passed away from it. It's like, yeah, there's, it's pretty easy to go back and look at their career and understand what made them different than a guy like Wayne Gretzky. My – I think the reason why they don't say anything, and um, I haven't dug enough deep into it. I think it has to be legal reasons. Like, they have to mm-hmm. be, like, covering something. Totally. Like, we can't say one way as this way. As soon as they admit it, they got to write a check, right? Yeah, like, yeah. it's got to be something legally that they're saying there. But as far as Chris Simon goes, like, he had to have been terrifying to play against. Yeah. Um, if anyone touched Joe Sackett, which I think happened in one of the playoff rounds, like, he went after them. And the thing about Chris Simon is, like, he was a good player. Like, he could play hockey, too. It wasn't just, like, you know, Peter Worrell. That's or, exactly yeah, who I was going to say. Or, like, <laughs> even, like, McDermott, like, we talk, like, he could only play three minutes. Like, Chris Simon could play. He could, He almost had a 30-goal year one year. Yeah. Like, he could play hockey, too. So, just really sad. Like, he was that enforcer on that 95-96 team, which I hold near and dear to my heart because I followed them very closely and – yeah, it just stinks because he was a good player too. This might be a false memory. Let me know if it's wrong. Did Chris Simon also play with the Denver Grizzlies before the Avalanche came to town? And it was uh, kind of from no, he he was on the Nordiques. He was. Yeah, I don't know where I got that. My seven year old memory. Ziggy Palfy had long hair, and he was on the Denver Grizzlies, I believe. <laughs> very different did players. He? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ziggy Palfy played oh, for the Denver Grizzlies. I think he was. I think he See, did play for the Grizzlies. Our seven year old memory is here. Yeah, I know. That Telling was 30 lies. years ago. I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> I can't even remember someone's name who I met today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I think we've reached our time for today's podcast, guys. This was yeah, this Google was awesome. This he, did not, <laughs> he did not play for the Denver There we Grizzlies. go. I, I, I believe Devin. I, uh, I wasn't standing strong by that no, one. I know what I think is because the, the Grizzlies were in the, was it the IHL? Uh-huh. I think so. Um, and who played in the IHL was Radic Bonk. Who nice. Had, who had the long mullet? <laughs> That's where I think my brain went. Radic bonk. Radic bonk. I have no great. idea where I got that. <laughs> uh, he he did play. Uh, he played for the Ottawa 67s and the Sioux Greyhounds. Then he played uh, half a season for the Halifax Citadels of the AHL. Before being called. No, he played for the Grizzlies. 
Really? He did. Chris Simon? No, Ziggy Puffy. Oh, oh, oh. oh. All right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got All, one. Also, yeah. <laughs> I got one. His seven-year-old brain was right. Yours uh, was not. Classic. <laughs> Stupid seven-year-old me. But, yeah, thanks oh, thanks again for hanging out with us. Of course, Av's game tonight and the, the Rome the Rome stand. The home stand <laughs> uh, is exciting stuff. So, of course, we'll be back next week and uh, follow Colorado Hockey Now for all of your written content and, of course, Guerrilla Sports for all your video content. Thanks for hanging out with us. See ya. See ya.